So finally, we'll talk about reactions of epoxides. And we hinted at earlier that epoxides have ring strain, and that makes them capable of chemical reactions that all the other ethers don't do. Uh, and in this case, it turns out with that ring strain, it turns out the two carbons of the epoxide are electrophilic. Now, they're already partially positive, but if we attack one of them with a nucleophile and allow this three-membered ring to open, uh, relieving that ring strain is a big incentive for this reaction to occur. Uh, so it turns out there's going to happen under one of two different sets of conditions. We can do this with a strong nucleophile like we're doing here. So and with a strong nucleophile, and you can tell this was strong, it's got a negative charge. So with a strong nucleophile, you want to look at this as being very, very SN2-like. So, and you're simply going to do backside attack, and whichever one of these two carbons is less hindered backside attack, that's where the reaction is going to occur. So if we notice this one right here is a tertiary carbon, this one down here is secondary, so backside attacks going to occur down here. Now with the oxygen on the wedge position, backside attack means this OCH3 is going to attach here at the dashed position. So we haven't done anything to break this bond right here though, and so that's still a wedge right here. So the key is the carbon we attack right here is going to experience inversion, but the carbon of the epoxide we didn't attack is not going to experience inversion. So and then from here we're simply going to do a proton transfer reaction. So add some H3O plus in the second step here in this case uh, to do a proton transfer and end up with an alcohol. So that is the reaction of an epoxide with a strong nucleophile, but it turns out the second set of conditions, we can do an acid catalyzed uh, version with a weak nucleophile as well. So we just said that with a weak nucleophile, we might do acid catalyzed ring opening of an epoxide. So generally we don't do this with strong nucleophiles. Strong nucleophiles are often strong bases and wouldn't survive acid. Uh, so, but with weak nucleophiles, they generally won't react with an epoxide without the acid. Uh, so in this case, we're going to use an alcohol, and water and alcohols are very common weak nucleophiles we would do this with. Uh, but we need that acid catalyst, and here I've just simply written H+, but this might be very commonly H2SO4, if we're going to show the specific acid. Uh, but the first step here, we're simply going to do a proton transfer. So and add that H right there. Now, once we've done this, it turns out we have actually activated these two carbons. They're actually even more electrophilic now. The amount of partial positive charge they have is greater than before we protonated. They're actually a little bit carbocation-like even. Uh, and in this case, if you take a look at them, so we're going to see some funkiness here. Uh, this is still a secondary carbon, and this is still a tertiary carbon. I'm using the same original epoxide as the last example. And what we'll find, though, is that the carbocation-like nature is kind of the most important thing for electronic effects. And it turns out this tertiary carbon is now the most reactive. And so preferentially, we're going to attack right there. So and that's why we're showing attacking on the more substituted side. Now, it turns out, though, we can't just make a general rule of attacking on the more substituted side. Although, caveat, a lot of professors will, uh, just to simplify it. But the truth is this. If it has a chance of attacking one of the, if one of the two carbons of the epoxide, the tertiary, that's the preference. So more important than the lack of, you know, the lack of steric hindrance is the carbocation-like stability here uh, with that significant amount of partial positive charge it'll give it. Uh, but after that, it turns out it's more looking for the less hindered backside attack. And so primary is actually more reactive than secondary. So it's kind of a funky reactivity. It's this interplay of electronic effects and steric effects. But you should know that if you've got a choice, tertiary is the best. But it doesn't go tertiary, then secondary, then primary. It goes tertiary, then primary, then secondary. So a little bit funky here. Uh, but in this case, we're, where we attack, we still get inversion of configuration. So if you notice, uh, our epoxide here is on the wedged bond. And so if we do backside attack before breaking that open, what we attach is going to now be attached by the dashed bond. So and that's why our methanol here that just attached is now on the dashed bond. So it's also why this methyl group right here gets inverted and flipped around to the other side. So there's your inversion of configuration and once again taking place on the carbon you attack. Uh, but just as in the last example, we are not touching this bond at all. And so it is still a wedged bond right here. So and then finally, we just finish this reaction up with a proton transfer. And your solvent, which is generally your nucleophile, just comes in and deprotonates. Uh, one of the big mistakes students make is they'll have methanol come and attack, and magically, they'll already have it so that the H is already gone. But we do need a separate step here, this third step, to actually do that proton transfer, that deprotonation.